first for flourishing. That's what we've been talking about coming up, that we want God first within our lives. And the message for today is going to be on first for flourishing. We interrupt this message to do an official first check on devotions? Oh, I guess we're interrupting the message. We're switching directions. That worked for you? The first check on devotions. Yes, we've been encouraging everyone to read through the New Testament with us this year, right? Yeah, and, and hopefully yesterday you finished, if you're on schedule with us, the Gospel of Matthew. And today we begin the Gospel of Mark. I could say that's my favorite, but... <laughs> That would be self-serving. I'm going to talk about the Gospel of Mark. And why do we have four Gospels? Why do we need four Gospels? Why are there only four Gospels? And as we launch our way into this next Gospel, what's it all about? Why is it so different? We're going to understand that so much better as we spend this time together. But first, take that precious gift of God's Word Hold it in your hand and stand with me as we declare this together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living word. You may be seated and open up to John chapter 21 as I tell you a joke that is not scripturally accurate. It's only a joke. This is a joke. This is only a joke. For the next 30 seconds, it's just a test of the pastoral joke system. <laughs> okay. So this Pentecostal minister, Baptist preacher, and Catholic priests all died and went to heaven. And they get to heaven. And Peter says, oh man, we're, we're not, we, were, we were expecting you guys next week. I don't know how the confusion happened, but we don't have a room ready for you. So St. Peter calls up Satan and says, Satan, I've got this Catholic priest, this Baptist preacher, and a Pentecostal minister. I don't have room for him. Can you, put it, can you take him down in hell for a few days? I just need a week. Satan says, whatever. Well, the next day, the phone rings for Peter, and Peter answers the phone. It's Satan. He's complaining. He says, I don't want these guys here. You're taking them back, and you're taking them back right now. Peter says, what's wrong? He says, well, the Catholic priest is going around forgiving everybody. The Baptist preacher is going around and getting everybody saved. And the Pentecostal minister has raised enough money to put on air conditioning. John chapter 21, verse 25, the last verse of this gospel, and it is just such a cool thing. It says, and there are so many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. John is just saying there's so much. That's the end of the four Gospels. And at the end of the fourth Gospel, the last Gospel that was written, John says, we could write down all of it, but the world couldn't hold all the books. Just so many amazing things. So let's take and let's walk through our devotional check together. Devotional check, yeah. Putting God first reading through the New Testament together, 287 chapters that we're dividing up over 365 days, and encouraging you to be part of that. You should have finished the Gospel of Matthew yesterday and starting on the Gospel of Mark. I want to know, not to discourage anyone, not for anybody to feel bad, but I want to know if you're doing your daily devotions or at least most of the time you're getting your devotions in. Slip your hand up. Good. Oh, whew, thank you. And you're on track with us with Gospel of Mark today? Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm so glad about that. Now, it's not too late to start today. 
Yeah, you can start today and just start on the Gospel of Mark with us and just be right in line with us, and it'll be fantastic. Be with us in the Gospel of Mark starting today. Now, let's take part number two. We'll answer this. Why are there four Gospels? That's a really good question. Have you ever wonder about that? Why are there not just one Gospel? Why are there not ten Gospels? Well, we'll take a look at that because it really is a good question. Why four Gospels? Why would we have four? Well, if we understand what John told us in John 21, 25, the last verse of the four Gospels, the world couldn't hold all the books if, if you wrote down everything that Jesus did and said. It was so mind-blowing. So why four? Why four Gospels? We'll understand what Gospel is first. Gospel means good news. It's the good news of Jesus. All four of them were written with different purposes to different audiences, and they contain complementary, not contradictory, but complementary information that helps us to better know Jesus, the Christ, our Savior. Why just four Gospels? Why not ten? Well, that's because the early church fathers recognized these four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as being authentic, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The early church fathers that spoke about them said, yeah, Matthew really wrote that. Yeah, Mark really wrote that. Yeah, Luke, I know him. He wrote it. Yes, John, I was one of his disciples. He wrote that. And these four Gospels were used in the early church. That's how they knew these were both inspired and authentic now, there are also frauds, too. There are fraudulent Gospels. Every once in a while, the news tries to bring up, oh, this great discovery, they found the Gospel of Thomas. They found the Gospel of Judas. They found this. And all they are is they're called pseudopigrapha. Pseudopigrapha means false writings. They were not really written by the disciples, they were written by, in some cases, Judaizers, in some cases, Gnostics. They were people that had their own agenda that distorted the truth in order to make it fit what they wanted it to be and to take advantage of other people. This was a problem that the Apostle Paul had. You see, if you wanted to pass off a $20 bill as being a real $20 bill, you wouldn't make it look orange. Unless, of course, you're in England or whatever. But in a $20 bill, you're going to make it green. You're going to make it look authentic. And they tried to make their pseudopigrapha, their false writings, authentic because they would sign the name of an apostle at the end of it. Say, so, this is the apostle Thomas. He wrote this. No, he didn't. It's a false writing. And it was a problem that the Judaizers kept bringing in with the Apostle Paul. Paul would go and preach at Philippi at Corinth, and then the Judaizers would come in afterwards and say, we're here to give you the rest of the truth that Paul didn't have time to tell you. And Paul writes the book of Galatians and tells them, these people are lying to you. I did not send them. They're teaching you falsehood. And it says at the end of Galatians, he even writes, see, I'm writing this in my own hand, signing it, so they would know Paul's signature and know that it was what Paul wrote was true and not the garbage and the falsehood that was coming across. So the early church fathers helped us out and said, yep, these are the real ones, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, why four Gospels? Well, it's like, it's like this. You take a photograph from the front, from that side profile, from the other side profile. You get a picture that gives you a more complete and more accurate perspective of who our Savior Jesus is and what he means to us within our lives. They all deal with it from that different perspective. Matthew deals with people from the Jewish culture. Mark deals with people from the Roman culture and Luke from the Greek culture. It's not just that there are three different gospels there, but those first three gospels are actually linguistically three different Gospels, because Matthew was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, translated into Greek. Mark was written in Greek, immediately translated into Latin. Why Latin? Latin was the growing language of the empire. Our earliest manuscripts of Mark include 
Latin manuscripts and the Gospel of Luke written in extremely eloquent Greek by a Greek physician, a non-Jew. And the Gospel of John, what well, was just written for everybody, because we got all these different cultures and languages being covered. Matthew writes to the Jews and their history. That affects, too, what he's writing. He writes to the Jewish people who have gone through terrible captivity, not just from Babylon, but they have been ruled over by one empire over another empire. And most recently, they are in defiant servitude to the Roman Empire, and they don't like it. And then you include the other side of that perspective, though, and you have Mark's writing. Mark writes to the Roman church, which composed of both some Jews and a bunch of Gentiles, who saw themselves, instead of being the servitude slaves, these defiant captors, captives, the Romans saw themselves as proudly belonged, were part of the elite victors. When Jill and I were in Italy for our Venti Cinque Anniversario, our 25th anniversary, and we stayed initially when we were in the school there for Italian, we stayed at the home of Guido Trentini. That's a good Italian name, right? I asked Guido, were you born in Rome? And he didn't say, yes, I was born in Rome, I'm an Italian. He said, I am a Roman. Even today, they identify themselves. Those that are in Rome, that's like, we are the elite ones. We are the Romans. And that's how, when Mark writes to these Romans, they see themselves from a totally different perspective. We are the elite victors. Now, Luke, on the other hand, Luke is writing to the Greeks. And although the Greeks, Greece was militarily conquered by Rome, but they saw themselves as Greece conquered Rome philosophically because all of the Greek gods and goddesses, Rome took them, adopted them, and changed their names. The philosophies of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle became part of the intricate writings that were included into the whole philosophical system of the Roman Empire. So Luke sees himself in another perspective, and John writes to everybody to clearly identify who Jesus is. Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Trinity, and he's the Savior of the whole world. Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, no matter who you are, Jesus is the Savior. Because God loved the world so much, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's look at it, briefly pull together what was the Gospel of Matthew about? You just finished it. I think you understand pretty well. Written by Matthew Levi, one of the 12 apostles. He also, according to the early church fathers, it was the first one written. Why are they in that order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Because that's the order that the early church fathers said they were written in. And it was originally written in Hebrew, which is the language of the Jewish people. Matthew's Gospel. Matthew, a Jew writes to the Jewish people in their Jewish language about the Jewish Messiah fulfilling Jewish scripture to complete Judaism, bringing the salvation for the Jews. That's Matthew's gospel. It's all about Jesus is the promised Messiah. He's the fulfillment of prophecy, and that's why so many scriptures from the Old Testament are included in the book of Matthew, so they could see the Jewish Messiah fulfilling Jewish scripture for the Jewish people. Now we get into the gospel of Mark. It's different. It's very different from Matthew's gospel. Matthew started with the Old Testament lineage of who Jesus came from King David and follows that. Mark just jumps right in the middle when Jesus is getting in the start of ministry. The gospel of Mark that we're, we're going to start today together, right? Take two. That we're all going to start together today, right? <laughs> that was close. We're all going to start together today, right? Okay, that's a little bit better. For the next 24 days, we're going to spend time in this. 
So who is Mark? Well, his name isn't really Mark. His name is John Mark. His name is John Mark, and the evangelist Mark, you might not realize, but he's, he's in a bunch of scriptures all throughout the New Testament. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was the son of a woman named Mary, another very common name. Mary, who lived in Jerusalem, and her home was a meeting place for the disciples. So you got Mark hanging out at mom's house because mom is a Jewish mama who cooks really good. And who does he see? He sees all the apostles all the time. So he's hearing them share their accounts, and he's detailing it and writing it down, and especially spending time with Peter. Mark was also cousin of Barnabas. You know, Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, they went on the first missionary journey together. And in Mark chapter 14, you remember Jesus is at the Garden of Gethsemane? And the Gospel of Mark is the only one that includes it. It says there was this young guy that was there, and a Roman soldier grabbed him, and he tried to run away, and he stripped off his outer garment. And the guy ran home naked, just in his underwear. It doesn't say who it was, but some of the early church fathers says that was Mark himself. He's telling you of, that he was there, but doesn't want to use his name in it. Who's John Mark? Well, he went with Paul and his cousin Barnabas on the first missionary journey. He went with them. He was with Paul. He was with cousin Barney. And then he went back to Jerusalem before they were finished. I don't know if Mama got sick or Mama got lonely. <laughs> We don't know if there was something else that happened that he had to go home for, but he left, and Paul didn't like it. Paul felt like, you're, you're cutting out early. You're not keeping your commitment. You're not manning up to this. And Paul got really upset with him. In fact, Paul and Barnabas, when they were going to go on the next missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas had a big fight over whether to bring Mark with them on the next journey. Paul refused, no way, he's not going. I don't want that kid with me. He quit last time, not coming with me. And Barnabas, he's, he's the son of encouragement. Oh, Paul, he's just been a great ass. You know, and he, he tries to just encourage. You no, know, Paul is stubborn, absolutely no way. So big church fight happens. Big split happens. The dust settles, and what happens? Now we got two missionary teams going out. Paul goes out with Silas, and Barnabas goes out with Mark. And they continue their evangelism and outrage. Yeah. And this John Mark, 17 years later, after the big fight, when you see the Apostle Paul is about to die, we see that Mark had become a really important part of Paul's ministry, the last letter, last chapter of Paul's life. Paul says, and, and, and Mark, he's so important to me, so valuable to me. Paul had a change of heart, a repentant spirit. And I'll talk about that in my Acts commentary when that comes. Mark may also have been brought to the Lord by Peter, because you look in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 13, the apostle Peter says, that's my boy, Mark, he's my son. He wasn't biologically his son, but he was his son in the faith. So you see this John Mark is all over in the New Testament. Now let's compare and contrast and put up the context a little bit here. You see, everything that Matthew was writing to the Jewish people was constantly being screened against the authority of the Old Testament. Well, of course, it was Jewish people with Jewish writings. And additionally, his Jewish audience lived by the oral law, which became eventually recorded as the Babylonian Talmud. So everything in Jewish literature didn't just record the history, it shaped the way they thought. It controlled their daily lives. Think of the fiddler on the roof and Tevye saying, tradition, right? Everything goes by tradition. Everything goes by, and 
Jewish literature and that tradition controlled things. So Matthew writes and confronts the tradition. He writes and he confronts their belief system and uses their own scripture to show them clearly Jesus is the Messiah. But now Mark, in the same way, he uses the literature of the Romans because the literature of the Romans was exciting. It was so extensive. The Roman literature included poetry. It had comedy. It had tragedy. It had history. It had satire. It had rhetoric. It expressed what they were thinking, their thoughts, but it also molded their expectations because when you have all this stuff available to you, it's like, what channel should I watch? Got all these channels that you... There was so much that the fast-paced nature of the Roman literature reflected. It was a busy empire. And Mark writes his gospel with an exciting, fast-paced Roman style to capture the Roman minds, to capture Roman hearts. He writes it in their language and in their thinking to fit their lives so they can know Jesus. He writes to a mixed Roman audience, revealing Jesus as the conquering leader for the Roman world to find salvation in and to follow. So the Gospel of Mark. Some refer to it as Peter's Gospel. History tells us Peter did supply a lot of the information. Mark is also writing to the Romans. He presents Jesus, therefore, as the Son of God, Son of Man in power. And you, you see the gospel. It's like, boom, power encounter. Boom, another power encounter. Jesus, who is God, the Son of Man, Son of God. So that's the gospel of Mark. We look at it and we see it's very different from Matthew because Matthew shared 15 parables. Well, that's parables are kind of Jewish in their storytelling nature. Mark only shares five of them because those five fit his Roman audience. Matthew revealed Jesus as the fulfillment of the law. But Mark is writing to the Romans. He never even uses the word law. When we look at Mark's gospel, it's shorter. It focuses on fewer events, but it gives a lot more detail. He uses 70 Greek words found nowhere else in the entire New Testament as he elaborates these incredible scenes and tries to paint a picture for you to experience being there for yourself. And the events move so fast. So fast. He uses this Greek word, this 40 different times. Now, the word is translated, most of the time you see it is translated as immediately Jesus went from there and did this over here. And immediately he went and did this. It's translated immediately, NIV uses without delay. King James Version uses straightway so that you would just be able to see constant action. It's, this is like a constant action movie where it's just one thing after another, one important scene after another. Now this word, is this, occurs 12 times just in chapter 1. You'll notice that eight times there it's translated as immediately. Go to Mark chapter 1. Let's, let's capture a little bit of the experience together. Mark chapter number 1. Because as you're reading in Mark, I want you to experience this with us. Twelve times in just chapter 1. Now you, you notice who he declares him to be. The very first verse of the Gospel of Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The Son of God. It's like, whoa. That's like on power with Caesar, on par with him. He's, he's son of God. And as he goes on and explains about John the Baptist and what's happening there, verse number 10, look at verse 10. And immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and a spirit descending upon him like a dove. Wow. The voice said, this is my beloved, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Verse 12, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was there and tempted and it just goes on and on. And verse 18, then immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. Verse 20, immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee and the boat. Wow. One after another. Verse 28, immediately 
his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. Take a look at verse number 30, where Simon's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told about him, told about her at once. So he went and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. You're kind of getting this. This is intense, isn't it? This is like action. Everything just boom, boom, boom. This is the gospel of Mark. It's an action gospel to help us experience Jesus' ministry. Mark also keeps the story alive with an extensive use of what we call the Greek present tense. Now, Matthew writes historically because Matthew's writing about the fulfillment of Scripture. So Jesus fulfilled this Scripture. And Mark says, and Jesus is doing this right now, present tense, just to draw you into the story so you can experience it with him. Now, in three weeks, because all those 16 chapters of Mark we're going to spread over 24 days, in three weeks, we can do the Gospel of Luke and let you learn about Luke and then the rest of the New Testament as well. If you want to, I can break down each one of the books of the New Testament like this for you so that you'll understand it. How many would say, this is helpful for me, Pastor? I would like to have you share this about each of the books in the New Testament. Let me see. You want this. You wanted this, I, I bring this to you, okay? <laughs> Okay, I do that for you. If it brings it alive for you and makes it so you will just be drawn into his word, that's what I want. I want that to happen for you. Okay? And Algoma, how many of you say? Okay, cool. Cocoa Beach, yeah, you like? Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sharon. All right, and Louisiana, yes, David, you got it. All right. All right. Takeaways. I want you to take away from this. Mark is going to be an awesome gospel to read. It is so cool. Join us with it. Start with it today. I believe we have additional copies of the schedule for reading through the New Testament. The 287 chapters spread over 365 days. God wants you to know him. I want you to take this away. God wants you to know him. He gave you this gospel and the other three gospels. He gave you this gospel like it's a personal letter to you so that you can see Jesus, so you can know Jesus, because God has a message for you. And as John reveals that message in another beautiful way, as he writes for everyone to come into relationship with God, John says, God loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his only son so that whoever, whosoever believes in him, anybody, anybody, Roman, Greek, Jew, whatever, anybody who believes in him, won't go to hell, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. And John says, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. You get enough condemnation in the world, don't you? He said, he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, the world could be saved. Stand with me as we close. We want that. God has given us his word, these beautiful, beautiful gospels. Now, you could not read all the books in the world. I have been working at reading through the top 100 novels of all time. Not done yet, but I have read all the writings of Tolstoy, all the writings of Dostoevsky. I have read so many of the, the classic books, and some of them are like, you take Tolstoy's War and Peace. That's a little bit long. <laughs> I read the whole thing. You can read the Gospels in one twentieth of the time of reading War and Peace. You can read it. You can read four simple Gospels. And when you do, you're going to find out just how precious you are, how loved you are, how, how much God really does care about you, and how Jesus can step into our lives. And we want him to do that right now. Would you just bow your heads with me and just close your eyes? In this precious moment, I want to pray with you. 
We sang the song earlier that may every day and every way I live bring glory to you, God. And maybe you're looking in your life right now saying, you know what? Uh, not every day and not in every way is he getting glorified in my life. Maybe you think, you know, I need to get my life right with God. I want to pray with you to do that. If, if maybe you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, or maybe you just need to give your heart to Jesus, I want to pray with you. Just slip your hand up right now. Just slip your hand up real quick, and I'll pray with you. And those of you online as well, don't miss this moment. Pray with us. I want us all to pray together for those that are, are wanting to commit their lives, and we're all going to commit ourselves in every day, in every way we live to bring glory to him. Pray with me right out loud. Say, dear Jesus, right out loud, dear Jesus, you love me and nobody loves me like you. You gave your life for me. You died in your place for me, my place, for my sin. You paid for it all. And I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my personal Savior. Be the Lord of my life. I surrender myself to you. And I want to live my life in such a way that every day and in every way I live, I bring glory to you. I want you to be pleased with my life. Not so you will save me, you have saved me by grace for free. Not of anything I've done, but because of what you did. But I want to please you because I want to love you back for all the love you pour into my life. So I am yours, Jesus, forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my dear ones. Thank you for sharing these moments, for coming out and being here in the sanctuary with us. Thank you for those of you who've shared at our other campuses and online with us this morning. Love you. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. I'll see you Wednesday night for communion. And if you're going to be online with us for Wednesday night, get your communion ready. Get some grape juice. Get your bread ready. We will have it here in the sanctuary. And for anybody that would like to pick up pre-packaged communion for Wednesday night, I have it ready in the back for you. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed.